Okay, in the last video I described what we're going to be doing, but uh, I'll go over it briefly once again. We're going to be um, reading uh, Ed Edmund Husserl's Analyses Concerning Passive and Active Synthesis. It's an important work for understanding, or lectures on transcendental logic, translated by Anthony J. Steinbach. This was translated in, into English in 2001. And uh, it's a really important work for understanding uh, the phenomenology, especially gen genetic phenomenology, which is uh, probably the most uh, important um, method or the important, most important development of phenomenology in a while, uh, along with gen generative phenomenology, which is important also, but has generated, I think, less, less interest. Um, but that was actually begun by Anthony J. Steinbach, who that uh, was developed. In, in depth by Anthony Steinbach, Anthony J. Steinbach in his book Home and Beyond, and he's also the translator. And we're going to be of this book, and we're going to be reading um, section one, where we're going to be reading part of section one of the translator's introduction. That's Anthony Steinbach. Historical and conceptual context. Okay, presented here as analyses concerning passive and active synthesis. Lectures on Transcendental Logic is one of Edmund Husserl's most renowned series of lectures presented in the 1920s. Offered three times in winter, winter semester 1920 and 21, summer semester 1923, and winter semester 1925 26, Husserl's lectures are virtually con contemporaneous with writings devoted to the problem of intersubjectivity and individuation in 1921 through 1927. Um, his reflections on the reduction from Erst philosophy in 1923 and 24, and his considerations of cultural crises and its potential for renewal in the Kaizo articles 1922 and 24. As such, the analyses occupy both an historical and a conceptual middle point of Husserl's work. Historically speaking, the analyses are situated between major, well-known published works. On the one hand, they arise 20 years after Husserl's groundbreaking Logical Investigations, yeah, printed in 1900 and 1901, a decade and a half after his first lectures on time consciousness in 1905, and nearly 10 years following his Ideas, 1913. On the other, these lectures pre precede by several years his formal and transcendental logic and his Cartesian meditations, both from 1929, and they anticipate his crisis of the European sciences, 1934 through 1937, which was Husserl's last last published work. By by more than a decade, these 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 anticipate those those works, or uh, the crisis. While the major insights, novel notions, as well as the import and contribution of these lectures will be explained below, it is possible to say provisionally that these lectures also occupy a center point, conceptually. As expressive, even exemplary, of his genetic method, they succeed Husserl's earlier phenomenology of consciousness by surpassing both the Cartesian static analysis analysis peculiar to the ideas, there's a book he published called Ideas, and the formalism of his early time consciousness lectures, and they anticipate his generative investigations into intersubjectivity, history, and the life world by initiating a regressive style of inquiry into origins that becomes the hallmark of Husserl's later undertakings in the crisis. Husserl's, fa Husserl's fame was well established by the time these lectures, or by the time of these lectures. According to the Quasterecten, or the, registra the registrar's list at Albert Ludwig's uh, Universität in Freiburg, where Husserl held these lectures, Husserl had 176 persons in attendance the first time he gave them under the title of Logic in 1920 and 21. 133 enrolled in 1923, uh, now entitled Selected Phenomenological Problems. And the numbers tallied 65 in 20, 1926, 1925 and 1926 in lectures newly entitled Fundamental Problems of Logic. A survey, a survey of, those, of these registrar's lists reveal a number of names familiar to those acquainted with the phenomenological tradition. Alfred Adler, Oscar Becker, 
Franz Josef Brecht, Kathy Hamburger, Max Horkheimer, uh, Fritz Kaufman, Paul La Landsberg, Walther Marcial, Arnold Metzger, Fritz Newman, Hans Reiner, uh, Wilhelm, ooh, I don't know this guy, Wilhelm Zelassi, uh, Marvin Farber, Carl Hanser, Ludwig Lang uh, Langerby, big, uh, Hasimi Tanabi, and Eigen Fink. Again, uh, Ludwig Langerby and Walter Sachs. Anyway, one, passive synthesis and transcendental logic. Um, in recent years, these lectures have achieved a nearly legendary status under the shorthand rubric of passive synthesis in, in Germany or other countries. Uh, how, how does a lecture series preoccupied with the general problem of logic win its worldwide renown as the passive synthesis lectures? There are at least two reasons for this. One editorial, one philosophical. After discussing these reasons, I explain the composition of this English edition and the reasons for its revised title. A. One reason these lectures have come to be known as the passive synthesis lectures, a reason almost too obvious to mention, is due to the title assigned to them by the editor of Husseriliana 11, Margot Fleischer. Namely, Analyzen zur passiven, passiven Synthesis, 1966, Analysis Concerning Passive Synthesis. Why this title? The original titles Husserl gave to the lectures, Logic, Selected Phenomenological Problems, and Fundamental Problems of Logic, she notes, were simply too broad for the collection of texts that she assembled in the Husserlian volume, Husseriliana volume. Husseriliana is the, the uh, what do you want to call it? Uh, it's, uh, it's the, the, the title of the, of the publication that comes out every so often, uh, I think, maybe once a year or some, maybe more or less, I'm not sure, but uh, it's basically the collected works of Edmund Husserl that are being, that are being put out as their as his works are being edited and collected together and translated into different languages. So it was uh, just to call them logic or whatever he wanted to call them. They were, they were too broad. And uh, so the person who assembled the, the text uh, gave them the, the title passive synth uh, analyses concerning passive synthesis. While the title Transcendental Logic, which, which Husserl assigned to the lectures on the folders containing the manuscripts, did give them more specification. This was, to her mind, still too imprecise. Instead, she wished to capture the sense attributed to these investigations by Husserl himself, to wit, er constitutionen, or the analysis of primordial modes of constitution. And while she would uh, while she could have chosen the title Transcendental Aesthetic to evoke the sense, the sense of, the invest, of the investigations, a title suggested by the occurrence of this expression both in the analyses and in the formal and transcendental logic, she thought that in the wake of Kant, it would have given the reader a false impression of what was to be expected from this work. For these reasons, Fleischer settled on the expression Passive Synthesis for the title of this collection, uniting the main portion of the lectures she collated and the supplementary material. This expression is not unwarranted, for it occurs at least half a dozen times throughout the work. It has de facto proved itself to be a title suited to the material selected for publication in Husserlia, Husserliana 11. B. Remember he said there were, there were two reasons. A was the editorial and one philosophical. B. So here it is, the philosophical reason. B. The title, however, the title, however, is not the sole reason for these lectures to have acquired their acclaim as the passive synthesis work. While the issue of passive synthesis is a fundamental one and does occupy a large portion of Husserl's investigations at Husserliana 11, the context in which, these, in which the lectures unfold is a broader one. This, this context, as intimated above, is transcendental logic. And we'll continue if you can hang. <laughs> we'll continue uh, in the next video.